This episode of the Topcast is proudly supported by My Music Staff. There's so many good things to know about what happens to you when you are traumatized and what you can do to come out of it again. But your body does keep the score. Things change when trauma happens. Hi, teachers, and welcome back to the Topcast. It's Tim Topham here, and it's super to have you with me again today. I hope you've been enjoying our episodes so far in the last uh, couple of months. It's so much fun putting these together for you, and I know that you're going to enjoy tuning in to today's episode with a repeat guest, actually. It's the wonderful Leela Viss, great friend of mine and friend to many, many of you around there and an inspiration to many of you. Leela, as many of you will know, and as we'll unpack in this episode, has had a very challenging last 12 months. And when I found out that she was presenting at NCKP and giving one of their TEDx talks and and their super short and focused 20 minute talks, I did one of those a couple of years ago uh, and it was a real challenge actually, I must say, it's super hard. It's almost harder giving a shorter presentation than a longer one in some ways because you've got to really work out what you want to put in it. Anyway, Leela put in hours and hours of work into this uh, presentation and uh, and so I wanted to share it with more people uh, and Leela did as well obviously so she comes on here and um, we, we talk a little bit about the presentation about how she's going what brought her to um, present on this particular topic and what we can expect from it and what she would like you to take away from it and the title of the presentation as we'll hear in just a moment is called Keeping It Together When Life Falls Apart. And uh, we'll be presenting or sharing that in uh, just a bit of a moment, actually. So we'll uh, we'll start with an interview, uh, getting to getting to catch up with Leela first, then we'll play that and then we'll ch- catch up with her at the end as well to um, wrap things up. Leela Viss is a piano teacher, presenter and author based in Denver, Colorado. She has a mix of styles in her teaching, blending written instruction and reading and all that kind of stuff with lots of creativity. In 2012, she began a blog about piano teaching at leelavis.com. Her fascination with the iPad and apps resulted in a book called The iPad Piano Studio, Keys to Unlocking the Power of Apps. And with Bradley Sowash, Leela co-founded 88 Creative Keys. I know a number of people listening have been to some of their events. The six-year venture featured webinars and workshops on how to encourage improvisation. At the University of Denver, Leela coordinated the Piano Preparatory Program for three years with Chi Hua Tan. Leela presents frequently at national and international conferences. She penned a regular column for the Clavier Companion and currently sits on the editorial committee of the American Music Teacher Magazine for MTNA. As a longtime church organist, choir and worship team pianist, Leela enjoys putting a fresh twist on old hymns and tunes. Her latest projects include her Key Ideas podcast, definitely go and check that out, a digital course and writing a book about a devastating family event. We're going to unpack that a little bit more in detail today uh, and we will have all our show notes, etc. over at topmusic.co slash episode 265 today. But in the meantime, welcome back to the podcast, Leela Viss. Thank you, Tim. It's been a long time. It I'm has. Glad to be back. <laughs> I, I cannot believe you were. I was looking back through our archives. You've been on. You've been on a few shows, and you've been on some shows not live. But when I've gone through like my best of shows, so you did. We did a full episode around November 2017. That was episode 112 on lesson planning and having a mission which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Highly recommended that people go back to that one. And you were right back, episode five. Can you believe it? Mm-hmm. 2015, May 2015, episode five with Bradley. That was one of the first times the three of us got together and did a, a content thing, I think. <laughs> that was way back when you guys were working together and starting to do webinars and all that. It seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? It does. I know. And it's. I think it does because we lost a year. Well, mm-hmm. okay. And more, mm. <laughs> but it does feel like centuries ago. And that was when did you come out to Eighty Eight Creative Keys to the state for the workshop? I think that was twenty seventeen. I think mm-hmm. does that sound right? And then it's been fun to see all the posts on Facebook of all our memories of oh yes when we yes were together. yes I know. And we didn't think back then that that might not be something we could do. Of course. No, I know. And, you know, I feel bad because I was just at a family reunion in summer of 2019 and was complaining like, okay, this is enough of this family thing. I want to just go <laughs> on a vacation. And now I think, okay, it, I don't know if that will happen again. 
the mm. reunion that we had with our family. So same thing with conferences. I, I don't think we will ever take them for granted ever, ever again. No, that's right. I sure am looking forward to getting back to being able to travel. I mean, Australia has, I mean, just slammed its doors shut. We cannot leave. No one can come in really. Uh, and it's going to stay like that until we're all vaccinated, I think, which is into next year by the looks of how we're going <laughs> we're being very slow i can't wait to get over there again and see you guys and be able to hang out and selfishly i'm sad for a couple of things number one because i don't get to see all my good friends and they can't come over here but also i really want to go to australia mm. that is on my bucket list and uh wow i i want to be able to go so please open up and get things straightened out over there please yeah, we can't wait to host you. And uh, I've got, uh, not that people can see, but I've got the island background on Zoom. I'm sure many people have used that one before to make them feel better about winter. Because <laughs> it's pretty miserable here at the moment. We're in the middle of winter. Um, anyway, look, so much has happened, um, as we say, since since we last saw each other and you were last on the podcast. And 2020 was an especially hard year for you. Um, before we dive into a little bit of that and um, share your talk from NCKP, which is the main um, thing we want to do today, um, what are you up to these days? Well, I just got done with a walk, finished with a walk. So it's very nice here, very warm. It's very smoky because we have smoke coming from California, from the huge fires over there. So it's a very odd summer yet once again, but we are somewhat covid I don't know. We're not in lockdown, but we're all a little nervous because school is starting very, very soon. And mm. it's not sure if masks are going to be required or not at schools. And it just seems a little uncertain. So right now I am taking two weeks off to get everything set for my lessons starting up at the end of August. And I'm wondering the same thing. Will I be teaching with a mask on? I really do not want to go back online. So I will do what it takes to mm. stay safe. And in the meantime, I'm having fun planning and working on my own podcast and writing blogs and figuring out what I'm going to do, finding repertoire, all that kind of good stuff. And do you still play? You're a performing musician. You play organ and piano as well in your church too? Yes. It was a busy yeah. weekend. I had a celebration of life service is what they're calling it now. And they asked if I could play the Hallelujah Chorus on the uh, organ. Okay. So I did. And that took all some stops practice. Out. <laughs> uh, all stops out. And I've got some good sheets and workarounds to make it happen. But that that was a lot of practice right there. And then I played for two services. One was a contemporary uh, service with, actually, it was just two singers. It wasn't even with a band. It was Leela and two singers. So then I had to kind of pull out all the stops on the piano, so to speak. And then <laughs> I hop on the organ and accompany the choir for a second service. So I did a lot of playing over this past weekend. Wow, yes. And uh but but that I mean that's something that you've always loved and continue to to do and it draws you back to your roots. Uh it's something that I'm trying to do more of as well, just reconnect with the instrument. It's so easy as teachers, isn't it, to get so busy and frazzled and and fried that we don't set aside time to just be with our own instrument and do the thing that brought us to this career that we've chosen, right? Absolutely. And I think because I have this church job, it keeps me playing because, mm. man, Saturday, there was a lot of other things I really wanted to do, but I had a number of things that I knew I needed to practice. If I wanted to play them well, I had to practice. So I did a lot of interleaving, which is the new latest mm -hmm. way to practice where I, I go back, work on hard parts, go off, do something else, come back, check them out. So that's how I end up spending a lot of my Saturdays is doing a lot of drive-by practice where I test things out on the piano. So yeah, it's, it's a treat and I don't take it for granted. It, and I'm working with some great people. So I appreciate that. And I think that has fed my soul through all of this. And especially when we were in lockdown and I could not play at services and we had to record everything. And I tell you what, I don't like recording. If I never have to record again, <laughs> I will be very happy. It's stressful. Yes, it I know. Is. So, um, you were presenting at the NCKP conference recently. That's the National Keyboard Conference for Keyboard Pedagogy. It's the one that I used to love coming to, shoot, to in Chicago, held every two years. Um, and it was all online this year. And shout out to the Francis Clark Center. I think they did a fantastic job of moving a conference online. That The Indeed. platform they used allowed interaction and they've got all the recordings available now. I think it was 
a really great decision on their behalf to to go virtual, fully virtual, and they did a really good job of it. So you were one of the speakers, and um, your uh, slot was called a PEDX talk, which is, um, for those who haven't been to this conference, it's a TED-style talk, 20-minute talk, and it's only offered to a very few, very select bunch of people. Um, so you are right up there. And Along you, with Tim Topham. <laughs> I have done one in the past, not uh-huh. this one. Um, but I know how much work goes into it. And so one of the reasons... I wanted to ask you on the show today was to share this recording to to more people who couldn't be there because it is so powerful. It has so much meaning as well. And um, and so I want to go into that just a little bit with you and then we'll have a, an actual listen to your 20-minute talk. Um, but as the topic of the talk is called Keeping It Together When Life Falls Apart. So let's just talk you better give everyone just the quick overview if they aren't familiar with you and what happened to you perhaps just to give a little bit of context Mm -hmm. so on thanksgiving 2019 we received a call that our son carter who was 25 at the time was snorkeling and was struck by a boat and then that evening we got on the plane and we knew that he lost his right arm and we didn't know if he would keep his legs So, as you can imagine, it was devastating news and life has never been the same. And it's been an uphill battle since then. And that was one of the reasons why I was very passionate about giving this talk is all of the things that I have learned since that experience. So, that's... Mm. That's the short story. Yeah, and and we'll get the longer story as, as we um we play this uh, presentation that you've put together, and I, I think it to, to kind of summarise it. I guess the main theme running through this, the thread is around the intersection of music and your healing journey. And I was really interested to hear how your experience with music changed over the period from not wanting involvement to it being quite cathartic and helpful for you. Was that unexpected? Oh, definitely. And I have a slide that I know the listeners won't be able to see, but I call it my grief playlist. And what was so fascinating, it was interesting because I could be so sad and yet there was part of my brain that was kind of watching myself like, oh, she's not listening to music. Why is she not listening to music? And Hmm. And we, my husband and I would talk about that, like, we can't listen. There was just something that was, it was too powerful that we couldn't handle it right now. And so part of my session is the journey back to finding music and why it became cathartic and why it was so important to me. And so I, I think I'm pretty good at being able to watch myself from a distance even, I don't know, you know, on the shoulder, just like, oh, she's doing this. And wow, she did that. And I can't believe she's feeling that way. And so that fascination got me thinking, you know, this story is worth telling. And I would say, you know, Carter is my son and he is one strong young man. And it is part of my goal to make sure that he does make a difference with this accident. And so I that's my number one reason, which is a little strange, but he is also a player himself. And so I not only watched my husband and his journey with music, my journey with music, and also Carter's journey with music. So it, I felt like it was hard, but I was able to tie in all of that into this talk and then bring it back to teachers, but I don't, I don't want to spoil it all. I want them to listen to it to find out how important they are. Well, I think this is as good a time as any. Why don't we have a listen to it right now? Think back to your morning. Did you tie your bathrobe? Did you button your shirt? Did you peel a banana? Did you fasten your seatbelt? Did you play a melody in one hand and accompany it in the other? Now imagine doing those things with one hand. On Thanksgiving 2019, my husband and I received a phone call a parent's worst nightmare phone call. That night, we boarded a plane in Denver, headed to Florida, knowing three things about our 25-year-old son, Carter, who you see in the middle of this picture. We knew that he was hit by a boat while snorkeling off the coast of Florida. We knew that he lost his right arm, 
And the doctors did not know if they could save his legs. In a heartbeat, our family was thrown into the arms of despair and landed a permanent relationship with grief. Now, I realize that our family is not alone. Since 2020, the world as we know it has been ripped from our arms and thrown into the firm grasp of a micro-monster. We idle in a wilderness wondering when the good of yesterday will return. On top of this, many have endured destructive fires, d devastating floods, and loss of loved ones. To some extent, we all share in a collective grief of ambiguous loss. There are many heart-wrenching stories, and I hold space for you and yours. So why do I feel compelled to tell you about our family story of grief? Most are familiar with the five stages of grief identified by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Anger, denial, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. I have a hard time with the acceptance stage, and I don't think I'll ever be able to embrace it. David Kessler, another expert in grief, recently released a book and shared his discovery of a sixth stage of grief called Finding Meaning. This stage resonates with me. I am determined to find meaning in our family's brokenness and loss. I find that I want to find meaning personally, communally, and musically. Personally, I claim a matriarchal, matriarchal duty. When the ventilator was removed days after the accident, Carter said two things that I'll never forget. I swam as fast as I could, and I can have more impact now than I did before the accident. By sharing Carter's story, I can help his initiatives as a marine biologist to accelerate a change in dive flags and maritime laws. Communally, collectively, we ache to find purpose and meaning in our loss. It's my intention that by sharing my family story of grief, that others may open up and practice reciprocity. Reciprocity is the art of exchanging things for mutual benefit. It's holding space for others in your heart and in your mind. And last, musically. From my own personal experience, I know that music is a powerful coping mechanism that restores and heals. My journey with grief and music made me curious. So I began to dig deeper into what research shows about grief, trauma, music, and the brain. On paper or on your website, you may call yourself a piano teacher, but through my research, I've discovered that we as music teachers are so much more than that. Now keep in mind, I am not a scientist or an expert. Everything I found in my Google searches, in books, and on YouTube videos, I've used to back my own speculations as a longtime musician and a recently heartbroken mom. Weeks before the accident, I had the privilege of hearing Renee Fleming talk at the CU Medical Campus. Through my research, I was pleased to find Renee and her Music in the Mind video sponsored by the Kennedy Center on YouTube. One of her guests was Daniel Leventon, author of This Is Your Brain on Music. He explained that brain scans show that both sides of the brain light up by music. Even if we are just listening to the music, the entire brain is activated. What else did I discover in my search? Some people are more prone to getting goosebumps when listening to music. And neurons from the front of the brain fire and wire together with neurons from the back of the brain. And when activated in, in unison, this is called mental synthesis, or what we call imagination. The brain is malleable. We call it neuroplasticity. When there's a loss of function or damage in the brain, it can be remapped or corrected by rerouting signals along a different pathway. Gray matter cells are responsible for the movement of muscles. Professional keyboard players have thicker gray matter. In a nutshell, music activates and stimulates the brain. 
What does research say about the triple threat of trauma, loss, and grief? First of all, the amygdala, the emotional processor, hijacks the brain. The prefrontal cortex, the cognitive processor, shuts down. The stress hormone called cortisol rises to high levels, constant levels of fight and flight. And the hippocampus, the storage center of the brain, burns out. When someone is experiencing trauma and they say, I think I lost my mind, it's actually true. My conclusions? While music lights up the entire brain, trauma triggers the fire alarm and switches systems to lockdown mode. I speculate that's why my husband and I could not listen to music after the accident. Physically, our brains were offline. Emotionally, music felt like a sharp knife piercing our souls. It felt like salt in a wound. Now, the height of the Christmas season was just around the corner, and so after spending two weeks with Carter in Florida, I headed back to Denver because I had to attend to my church job. At this point, numbness had set in. I was, as my good friend calls it, emotionally constipated. While the congregation listened to me play music during the services and they wept, I felt nothing. My aversion towards music slowly wore off and music evolved into an intervention as I trudged through the stages of grief. It was a piece by Norwegian composer Ola Jelo called Still that broke the silence. This is what I wrote to Mr. Jelo when asking him for permission to play his piece for this talk. Every one of my walks or runs begins with listening to Still. I believe it's because it connects with my emotions and allows them a place to land. Your music seems to understand without having to say a thing. Although I'm a spiritual person, I couldn't stomach hearing scripture quoted to me unless it was sung by David Beloche, Casting Crowns, or Chris Tomlin. New additions to my grief playlist coincided with the state of Carter's condition. As he improved, music became more tolerable. While two of our sons like to play video games in their spare time, Carter does as well, but he also likes to play Beethoven and Chopin. Weeks before the accident, I helped Carter purchase a new digital piano because he had been putting up with a pretty cheap keyboard and wanted one with better sound quality and touch. As we stayed with Carter, during his 68 days in the hospital, we spent most of our evenings in his one-bedroom condo. For weeks, I walked by his piano, and it couldn't touch it. It just didn't seem right. If he couldn't play it, neither could I. One night, while Chuck was watching tennis, I just couldn't resist, and I pushed the power button, and I started playing Brahms Rhapsody in G minor, seeing what I could remember of it. Over the next few days, I began to explore and play by ear the music I was listening to on my walks. That mental synthesis or imagination began to kick in and fresh patterns came to me. But my improvisations didn't reflect my feelings. Instead, what came was a musical reenactment of the accident through the eyes of Carter and his friend Andy. My emotions orbited around the story my music was a visceral place to hold my emotions and store the slideshow of the accident. Here's the story. It was a perfect day for snorkeling. Andy and Carter had been out for about two hours and decided to head back to shore when a boat struck Carter. Andy swam over as fast as he could and kept Carter afloat above water. A woman named Christine swam over with her paddle board and applied a tourniquet to Carter's arm. The bow driver turned around and loaded them all up, and within eight minutes, Carter was in an ambulance headed to a level one trauma center. My musical retelling of their story morphed into a composition I call Angel 94. The title is the passcode we used to see Carter in the hospital 
because his room had to be protected from too many visitors. By the way, he adores angelfish and he was born in 1994. There was something that we didn't know when we boarded that plane that Thanksgiving evening. When we got to the hospital, we learned that Carter's left hand was also injured. The doctor, who we call Dr. A, who performed the surgery on his hand, said the blade of the motor missed a main nerve of his left hand, his dominant hand, by one millimeter. Carter can't button a cuff on his shirt, and I have not seen him peel an orange or a banana. But he can slice a bagel, he can crack an egg, he can uncork a bottle of wine, he can care for his fish tanks, he can fasten his seatbelt, he can drive his Nissan Xterra, and he can play a melody in one hand and he accompany it in the same hand. I was an inexperienced teacher and young mama when I taught our three boys piano. I often got frustrated with them, it, and they got kind of frustrated with me. It wasn't a bright spot in my teaching career, and yet all three of them captivated their audiences when they performed. In high school, Carter performed a flawless and moving Moonlight Sonata for a mesmerized audience of his peers. One day when I walked into his hospital room, Carter took me by surprise and said, yeah, I guess I have to learn how to play piano again. I wanted to melt into a puddle of tears and yet I held my composure and I said, yeah, I guess you're right. He started to look on YouTube for one-handed pianists and he seemed to be open to the idea. On March 21, 2019, my husband secretly texted me letting me know that Carter was playing piano. In April, Car Carter recorded a lovely setting of It Is Well, arranged for one hand by Daniel Light. In August, Carter texted me this video. Dr. Anita Collins, an expert on brain development and musical learning, and well known for her viral TED Talk, says that when we play an instrument, the activity becomes more like a full body workout for the brain. In a podcast episode with Tim Topham, Dr. Collins argues that when parents let their kids quit an instrument because it gets hard, because that full body workout gets hard, they are letting their kids miss out on an important life lesson. Playing a musical instrument builds resilience in musicians who stick to an instrument when the going gets tough. Then Dr. Collins said this, we are breeding resilience out of our children. So this question came to me. After being struck by a boat, we watched Carter, confined to a hospital bed for weeks, learn how to walk on two legs that most considered irreparable, adapt to losing an arm, and play piano with one hand. Did Carter's practice efforts to play the piano and the bass guitar for over 20 years have something to do with his remarkable resilience? I don't know if there's scientific evidence to prove my theory. Yet, I claim to some degree that being a musician helped Carter power through and overcome staggering odds. In this picture, you see Andy and Christine who rescued Carter and you see Dr. Borrego and Dr. A, who saved Carter's legs and hand. Both doctors marvel at Carter's stunning recovery. Carter fought for his life and he won. He's back at Loggerhead Marine Life Center where they rescue sea turtles and where Carter tends to their aquariums. By the way, most sea turtles who are brought to the center for care have been struck by boats. Right now, Carter is between identities. He's been the desperate victim and the brave patient and done the hard work to get better physically. And now he faces the next challenge of getting better emotionally. He'd rather not be solely identified as a feel-good story, an inspiration, an amputee. 
He's looking for an identity that makes meaning out of his loss and his resilience. An identity that makes an impact on how humans behave in our oceans. Because I dropped everything on Thanksgiving 2019 to be in Florida with Carter, I told my studio families that I had to stop lessons and didn't know when I would return. While my husband stayed behind to care for Carter in Florida, I returned to Denver in February 2019 and began teaching again. And then of course pivoted to online lessons when the COVID lockdown began. One of my students named Lily, who was a junior in high school, opted out of lessons in December. She sent me this email in mid-February, soon after I opened my studio. Dear Miss Leela, at the beginning of the year, I made a super hard decision to take a small break from piano. I miss having you and piano in my life, and I truly regret my decision. There is nothing I would enjoy more than to come back. If you are willing to take me back, I know in my heart that I would work very hard to practice my skills and give it my all. I miss you and piano so, so much and have been thinking about you a lot, Lily. It wasn't until Lily abandoned piano that she discovered that it was too much a part of her to put it on the back burner. Lily identified as a pianist and she missed that part of herself. In this picture, you see us at our spring recital where there was a 70s vibe. I leave you with these questions. Who are you? What is your identity? My hope is that at least once in your lifetime, you receive a love letter like I did from Lily, a reminder of the important role that you and music play in the lives of your students. The pandemic has given us pause and so I hope you will take advantage of this pause and reconsider your role, your identities as a piano teacher. Yes, you are a teacher, but you're also an organizer, a bookkeeper, a corrector of mistakes, a cheerleader, a coach prepping for the next performance, and you are also a trainer that activates full body workouts for the brain, a breeder of resilience, a guide to a place where emotions can land, an instigator of imagination. You are a key holder. You have the potential to unlock the passion of music in others. And their passion could be the coping mechanism, the intervention, the identity, and the resilience that they need to keep it together when life falls apart. Thank you for listening. Look out for Carter at Florida Fish Boys, and you can find me at leelavis.com. Wow, Leela, uh, what a, an amazing uh, presentation. I know how long it takes to put something that comprehensive together, and you, you'd actually touched on a lot, of, a lot of different areas and research into the brain and all sorts of things. Um, what, what, what do you hope others get from what we've just heard? Well, thank you for acknowledging the fact that I did cover a lot and it was very hard to put it in a 20 minute talk. And sometimes maybe I default it too much, but I felt like everything was so important. And the funnel of that talk really came down to identity. And that didn't come right away. It was interesting how this talk came to me and I, I would think, oh, I want to include this or, oh, I want to include that. But, uh, I, I did know that I had a target audience of piano teachers at this conference and a larger audience of music teachers. And I want them to see the importance, and hopefully they did through this session, of music and what it can do for that person sitting on the bench or blowing that horn. Uh, it's bigger than anything that we could imagine giving them. You know, we can tell them this is a middle C, but at some point, they're going to take their music making and feed their own souls. You mentioned uh, Olia, Ola Yelo, who is a Norwegian or Scandinavian composer. Anyway, I'm not sure exactly where. Norwegian. Mm -hmm. Norwegian, who you've actually been in touch. You've communicated with him, haven't you? Uh, I, I remember you got me into him when I was in, we were in Florida. What was it for? MTNA? Mm -hmm. um, and I still remember 
sitting by the pool of my Airbnb while I was at the conference listening over and over to, I can't remember, what was the name of the track? Can you remember the one that you gave me? Piano Improvisations is probably one of my favorite ones, but I think still comes from maybe his Night album. I'm going to have to. That's that's the one that I listened to. That's the one that I could only listen to. Every rock, I started with that one. And so I really wanted to include that in the talk. So I emailed him, told him a brief synopsis of the story and asked if I could play still. And I don't think I talked to him, but I did talk to his agent and they Mm. said yes. And uh, so I did play it. I made a recording and played it. And um, shout out to James who made the whole recording for me and... Um, I know the listeners aren't watching it, but he was instrumental, pun intended, in getting this off the ground. And just the way he mixed in the music, I was just so happy with how he did that. Mm. Private music teachers and studio owners agree. My Music Staff is the number one studio management software. Designed specifically for music teachers, you can manage your student list, organize your schedule, track attendance, collect payments, and more all in one place. Visit mymusicstaff.com to sign up for a free trial. My Music Staff, teach more, stress less. So let's sort of bring us now to the present. How are you finding meaning, I guess, from from the accident? You've mentioned already, you know, Carter's, um, the work he's doing and with your help to try and change some of the laws around boating and things like that. So, yeah, what, what's what's the meaning that you're, you're getting now? Well, I've decided to write a book about this whole experience and feel like that can make a big impact. And the story was very well known and covered a lot by the media when it happened. And a reporter named Joe really did a beautiful spread on the whole story and covered a lot of the aspects of it. And it, there's so many side stories to it. It it really is fascinating. Again, putting myself aside and not including myself in the whole picture. It's something that I think people would find interesting, number one, and then tying in the power of music with the ocean and how important the ocean is to our earth and you know we're we're all highly aware now of what's going on with climate change and all of that and there's a lot of people with fast boats and there's just a lot of issues to cover <laughs> and so i just couldn't resist i'm like you know what i've always wanted to write a book and i remember it was it was two or three nights after the accident, and I was writing a Caring Bridge post. That was how we were updating people. I remember were, reading those, yeah. Okay. I was concerned about Carter, and I just fell onto my husband's shoulder, and it's like, this is the book I'm going to write. Not this, what you expected. Not what I wanted, but it just, it was clear to me that this mm. is the book. And what kind of feedback have you received so far from being so open about this? Well, that's interesting because I don't, I don't think I've gotten a lot of feedback when I, when I show it to people or when I give it to be to people, they do appreciate it. I think it's hard for people to know what to say say. Mm. because it's a monumental thing and I want to share it because I want reciprocity. And I talk about that in the talk too, is reciprocity is exchanging things for mutual benefit and for instance, this morning I was talking to a friend who's had a really hard time with some things and, you know, we were hugging and crying together. And I don't think that's bad. I think crying is okay. Being sad is okay. Grieving is okay. And it doesn't need to define you, but it will shape who you are. But I do find that people who have been through a really tough thing seem to have that ability to take in something as horrible as what happened to me and be able to still be with me and not panic about, okay, Mm. what do I say? And Mm. what is she going to do? And so I, I understand how it's hard for people, but I, I do hope that people come up to me and tell me their story. And I must say that after not so not after the talk, but after the accident, a number of piano teachers uh, reached out to me and told me their story. And I think what's interesting is so many people have 
horrible things in their lives that are private and they cannot tell the world. And Carter's story was out in the open, you know, like the world knew what happened. And so I feel like I want to share space and hold space for them because they are privately grieving. And sometimes that's even harder. Mm. Do you have any strategies then to, to, just to start wrapping things up or, or thoughts or resources for, for people who might be facing similarly challenging situations? Well, there's a couple of them. The Body Keeps the Score was instrumental, again, in helping my husband and I understand what trauma is and what it does to the body. Is that so a book? I highly recommend. Yes, it's a book. And The Body, sorry, say it again. The Body Keeps the Score. Okay, great. We'll put a link and in the show notes. What, spoiler alert, what's what's really sad about the book, but very, very, we need to know it, is that so much trauma is unresolved in people's life. And because it's unresolved, there are a lot of people that are messed up. And so it's a pretty heavy topic. It's very heavy, in fact. But there's so many good things to know about what happens to you when you are traumatized and what you can do to come out of it again. But your body does keep the score. Things change when trauma happens. And then he also talks about the the importance of music and especially communal music, making music together and singing with each other. So that's mm-hmm. what's striking right now is what we're all, we can't play together. We can't sing together. Now I am playing for choir again. So we're coming back into that, but that being taken away from us was huge. Mm-hmm. You know? So when people say they're sad and COVID brought them down, yes, there's so many reasons mentally, emotionally, and physically, because we were missing out on a lot of the things that were good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) Sorry, anything else we were going to (laughs) say? Well, I was going to say there, there is one thing because, you know, we were talking about, what are we going to talk about? And there's, uh, I just remember soon after this happened, we made a list of all the things that people shouldn't say to you (laughs) (laughs) after something like this, like at least and like, oh, at least this quote? didn't happen. Or... Right, right. Uh, yes. Okay. And, you know, so I'll, I'll just give you a few things. Don't ever say at least. Okay. One person did say to me, which I, it, it was my mantra then for the year was take courage. Apparently in, she was staying in an African village and she found out that her mother back home in the States had passed and that village had been through so much agony and sadness. And so they didn't say, I'm sorry. They said, take courage. Mm. So I, I liked hearing that. I think I needed to hear someone say those kind of things to me. I think sometimes you don't have to say anything being there showing up. I remember our neighbor knocked on the door and said, here's our phone number. Here's our you know, let us know what you need, or here's our email address. We can, we'll shovel your snow. You know, <sighs> they just took over those things. And mm. sometimes just acts like that are more or bringing important. food and Correct. Those sorts of things. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. So I think that can be important. And there's another book that my friend Joe gave me that uh, is called There is No Good Card for This. And it's quite something, huh. but it's really good for all of us who are walking along someone who has had trauma or something horrible happen. And I just, I like some of the things they have to say. And I think we tend to think we have to say things and we don't have to. Silence is okay. And listening. Oh my goodness. I Maybe that's why I gave the talk because I wanted people to listen. And instead of giving advice and quoting scripture and those kind of things. So yeah. I w- th- will make sure I would like to share those two books to make sure people know about them because I think they're very helpful mm, for us. That's great to know. So thank you. Thanks so much, Leela, for being so open and honest. Thank you for letting us reshare your, your talk that I know uh, blood, sweat, tears and hours and hours and hours went into practicing, rehearsing, working out what mm-hmm. to put in it. It's a huge undertaking, um, and uh, yeah, we thank you for being so open about this because you're right, there is there is a lot of trauma in the world. There's a lot of undealt with trauma in a lot of people in the world, and it's important that, you know, th- these kind of things that, that they're talked about and are normalized in some way because we're all feeling varying sense, senses of trauma f- even from the last year. Even if we like to say, you know, oh, but, you know, we've still got jobs or we're not sick and all those kinds of things that we use to make 
it seemed less of an impact, but um, COVID has had a massive impact on everyone and many teachers around the world. And yeah, it's, it's, I think it's just good to talk about. So thank you for coming uh, on the show today. Well, thank you. One, one final story. I just had a student come in and she was sad because her friend wasn't coming in for the lesson because her friend was sick. And we all know that there's Delta variant is hitting kids pretty hard. And she was upset. And yeah, I kind of went on with the lesson. And then I said, well, what do you want to play next? And I'm like, I don't care. And I'm like, oh, you usually are so excited. Like you are sad, aren't you? And then she just started crying. And I said, you may be sad, you know? And I think that's some of the things that we need to be doing as teachers is don't make it good. Don't make it you know, better. We don't have to try and make it better. Mm. Walk alongside, be sad with them mm. and, and, and then be okay. And then, then it, it was really neat to see her. She sang this song and from a chord chart and was playing as she was singing. And I got all teary. I was like, Oh, she's doing, you know, she's doing exactly what she wants to do, mm. even though she's sad. So yeah. It was just one of those special moments. So I think, you know, if anything, teachers, you don't have to have all the answers. Just be there. Mm. You don't have to be the life-giving energy giver as well no. that has to try and pull people up from no. their bad day and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I like your you know, the words you use, walk alongside. Mm -hmm. I'm around the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and then we perked up because then I was like, okay, you need to help me because I need some new practice tip ideas. And she's all into office supplies, just like me. And, you know, <laughs> she, I know it's weird, but I've got a couple of students like that. But, you know, letting letting them in on a little bit of you and what you need can help too. Mm. Well, we should probably wrap it up there. Thanks again, Leela. It's wonderful to reconnect with you. Um, thanks for being an amazing person and for sharing all this stuff. And where should people go to find out more about you and all the great things that you do and the courses well, that you've got and the blogs you've got and all that great <laughs> stuff? Well, thank you, Tim. I really thank you for opening your doors uh, of your podcast for this. It's really important to me in a number of ways, which I've stated already. So I, I greatly appreciate that. People can find me at leelavis.com, L-E-I-L-A. And then Vis is V as in Victor, I-S-S -S as in Sam. I have to say that all the time over the phone because no one hears it correctly. <laughs> and yes, I finished up a course not too long ago, How to Play Piano in a Band with my good friend, Drew Collins, who also is my podcast producer. And that was just so much fun. And I just recently wrote a blog about, oh, well, you have to do something in order to really make practice count. And it's called Eat the Frog. So I won't Ooh. say anything more, but let's okay. head on over and you can read about why eating the frog is important in piano lessons. And your podcast, your interseason number two, I think. Yes, it's called Key Ideas. And I just released my first episode and the second one will air soon. That's and, our second episode for season two. You've done the few. Yes. Yep. yep. I've got a number of uh, guests lined up, so I'm excited about it. And mm. keep listening to Tim's. I would say we're both different. We offer different things. So there's room for plenty of podcasts. <laughs> Absolutely. And we look forward to hearing when your book comes out as well. That's going to be very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks so much for coming don't on Don't hold the show. your breath. I'll just, I'll tell you that. It's going yeah. to be a little while. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you, Leela. <laughs> see ya. Thank you. You too, Tim. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show with the catch up with the wonderful Leela Viss. And uh, I look forward to catching up with her next time we manage to get overseas to a conference. Hopefully, uh, when our borders open and things get back to normal in the next couple of years. Now, next week on the podcast, drum roll, please. This is huge. We've been working on this one for a while. And I'm delighted to let you know that the wonderful, the amazing, Benjamin Zander, conductor, TED speaker, extraordinary person generally, is going to be joining us on the podcast. It's going to be so exciting. So, make sure you tune in. That is next week on the podcast, Benjamin Zander. And uh, until then, I'm Tim Topham. You've been listening to the Topcast. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll speak to you next week. Bye-bye. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member 
and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.